It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, my first question is to the Premier. Two months ago, on July 15th, the Minister of Health stood in this House and said, and I quote, I want to assure the Leader of the Official Opposition that there is a detailed contingency plan in place for a second wave. Can the Premier tell us when we will see the detailed contingency plan, which supposedly has been ready for months? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health to reply. Well, I can certainly assure the Leader of the Federal Opposition Speaker and everyone else in Ontario that the health and uh, well-being and safety of Ontarians is our top priority and always has been. To be clear, we will say that the latest numbers, uh, increase in numbers, have raised some concern. However, we are ready to deal with them. First of all, based on the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, we have decided to cease the opening of any further businesses or any other organizations for the next 28 days or two incubation periods in order to be able to uh, reassess and to uh, take a pause to avoid having to return to uh, broad-scale closures, which nobody wants to see. If we have to, we will, but we don't want to. What I would say is that wave two of COVID is going to be more complicated than dealing with wave one. First of all, because we have flu season also approaching, we know that also results in increased hospitalizations. We also have an increase in numbers of people coming from long-term care homes back into hospitals to uh, make sure that we can follow up on the infection prevention and control measures that we need to follow to continue their safety. Response. We also have an increasing number of uh, people that are requiring surgeries and procedures that were postponed from wave one that are uh, dealing with capacity issues. But I'll respond further to the member's question in my supplemental answer. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I'm uh, pleased that the minister actually acknowledged long-term care because the second wave is specifically uh, concerning when it comes to seniors in long-term care. As new outbreak uh, is underway, as folks might know, in the for-profit extended care West End Villa in Ottawa, where once again the private operators are telling families that they are facing staffing challenges as the number of inf numbers of infections in that home continue to rise and it's my understanding that that number now sits at 29 seniors in that home with covid-19 in july back in july the government released a long awaited study on the dire situation in staffing in long-term care homes. What has this government done, Speaker, to implement any of the recommendations that the report uh, is, uh, has, has put forward, especially now that the second wave is hitting our long-term care homes? Mr. Pell. We do have a comprehensive fall preparedness plan, which will be released very shortly, but it certainly does address the issue of health human resources. We know that there are issues that need to be dealt with there, but it is a plan that is going to build on some of the successes that we've already seen. We know that we have developed a robust testing strategy, for example, which has allowed us to achieve over 25,000 tests roughly per day. We're increasing that for the fall. We have had over 3 million Ontarians tested to date, and we're going to continue to increase that number. We also have seen uh, 148 dedicated assessment centres be created. We are going to build on that as well because we know there are areas where there are some wait times that are over the, the, uh, the times that we would like to see because we want everyone to get tested that needs to be tested. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the most important thing that we can do is for all Ontarians, all 14 and a half million of us, to continue to follow public health measures, Boss. to continue to make sure that people follow physical distancing, that they uh, wear masks where that's not possible, that they follow the hand hygiene, and if they're not feeling well, please don't go to work. This is vitally important for all of us in the province, and our plan is going to continue uh, to build on that. And all of the other health measures that we have in place, we're going to continue to emphasize them over the fall. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, anybody that says the word success in the same sentence as long-term care has not got a check on reality in terms of what happened here in our province. It was a failure, a failure from the 
from the get-go. The government has a blueprint for change in hand, apparently, but despite the Premier's promises of an iron ring around long-term care, that the lessons were learned, they have not been learned. Change has still not come to the long-term care sector, Speaker. And once again, overburdened, underpaid staff in long-term care homes are scrambling to deal with new outbreaks. The Champlain Region Family Council Network recently wrote the province asking, and I quote, where is Ontario's plan? Have long-term care staff been recruited and trained to supplement the already overburdened and underpaid staff in Ontario homes? I'd say that's a pretty darn good question, Speaker. We saw the nightmare that happened over the first couple of months of COVID-19. We watched family members beside themselves, in tears, horrified by what was happening in long-term care. It took the Canadian Armed Forces to turn back that curtain and show Ontarians the failure of this government and previous governments when it comes to long-term care. And now the second wave is here, and the question is, where is the plan for long-term care? With the second wave coming, is there an actual plan? Can they answer the questions of this family network? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you for the question. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the very important work of our staff and our frontline workers in long-term care under a very challenging circumstance, never been seen in this world. And I would also be remiss if I did not acknowledge all of the homes in Ontario who have done very well. We need to acknowledge their success. We need to acknowledge where we have challenges and where we need to do better. We must not diminish the effort of all the people who are working so hard in the front lines, looking after our loved ones every single day. We have challenges, and we are addressing them in an integrated way through Ministry of Long-Term Care, Ministry of, Health, Ministry of Health, our Ontario Public Health, the Ottawa Public Health Unit, and I can say we're in regular contact to make sure that we're offering absolutely every piece of support that we can for our homes, including N95s, evaluation of H. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next uh, question is also to the Premier, but I have to say it's the efforts of the government that were failing people in long-term care, not the efforts of the frontline workers, Speaker. The efforts of this government failed the people in long-term care and their family members. But it's not just long-term care, where the Conservatives are ignoring expert advice that could protect us in a second wave. Yesterday, health experts with the Hospital for Sick Children released findings of their study uh, into classroom COVID safety. And what they found is alarming, Speaker. It is alarming, but it is not unexpected at all, or it shouldn't be. Among other findings, the experts conclude that uh, it is, quote, not possible, not possible to maintain two-meter distance between students and accommodate more than 12 to 15 students in a typical classroom, even with the desks around the walls. Can the Premier explain why the government's back-to-school plan uh, allows more than 15 students in a classroom, knowing that this is not a safe way to go when experts are telling us it's not possible to follow social distancing guidelines with more than 15 students in a classroom. Minister of Education, your reply. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to confirm in every single school board in the province of Ontario, classroom sizes have been reduced. In every single school board, without exception. Order. With every school without Order. exception, we're seeing school boards work very hard to go well below the provincial average. Mr. Speaker, we're providing $200 million to hire over 2,000 new educators in a one-time expenditure to respond to this unprecedented challenge of COVID. In Toronto District School Board, for example, Speaker, in those higher risk communities, they are capped from kindergarten to grade three of 15. Between grade Order. four and eight, they are capped at 20 well below the average to ensure distancing, to ensure a stronger routine of hand hygiene, and yes, Speaker, to ensure that masking is in place were the only problems to do so within the classroom. What Sick Kids calls for is a comprehensive suite of actions, multi, a multitude Response. of actions to prevent the risk. That is what we've adopted, and we will continue to follow the advice of the Chief Medical Officer. The supplementary question. <laughs> 
Speaker, this government actually told the school boards to try to find the money in their contingency funds to get school classes down to a smaller size. That is completely irresponsible. They didn't want to fund it. They don't believe in funding public services. They'd rather give their friends tax breaks, Speaker. But what I'm saying is that we have the similar problem now, not just in classrooms, but in school buses. We all know that. In Ottawa this morning, six more school bus routes were cancelled, on top of the 38 school bus routes that were cancelled yesterday. This is a failure to protect our kids, and that failure left, left, uh, ended up with 200 kids and families having to self-isolate after health experts feared that COVID-19 uh, exposure was happening in the school buses. That's 200 family speaker who have now had to scramble to figure out what to do, take time off work, socially isolate, make other arrangements. Uh, it's, it's completely unacceptable. The number is only going to grow as outbreaks continue to spread like wildfire across our province. How does this government expect families to believe that they have a plan for the second wave when their current plan is actually unraveling before our eyes and exposing students, parents and education workers to the virus? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, it is this progressive Conservative government that has allocated $4.3 billion to combat COVID-19 and increased health expenditure. It's this government that put $1.3 billion invested to ensure we could respond to keep our schools safe. In the context of social services, we are investing more to ensure that all families, all students remain safe as we respond to this unprecedented challenge. Speaker, in the context of busing, a $1 billion on, a, on, a, on an annual basis we're putting in place. But in addition, to respond to this challenge, $40 million to increase cleaning, assigned seating of every bus in the province of Ontario, PP for all staff, training for all bus drivers, the driver retention program, $40 million to incent them to participate and to stay in as workers. We provided that extension, Speaker, and $25 million for route protection. In each and every area, we lead this nation because we are fully committed to the protection of all staff and all Fox. students. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker. What it is, I think what it is that the um, I think what it is that the education minister just admitted is that their plan is failing. That's right. Their plan is failing because kids are getting sick and families are having to, to isolate. That's what's happening in reality. But you know, for months now, we've been telling this government for months that without schools and without childcare, the everyday Ontarians who actually drive our province forward can't get to work, and our entire economy, uh, the entire economic recovery, is going to actually be at risk because they have not done the right thing. The Premier keeps ins insisting that no expense is going to be spared or no expense has been spared, but students and their parents parents see crowded classrooms speaker every day cancelled bus routes and case counts that keep climbing why does the premier have his head in the sand waiting for a second wave to hit instead of taking the action that he knows would help ontarians the action that he knows could stop the spread of covid-19 in our schools in our workplaces and buses and everywhere else around the Thank province thank you Minister of education Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health only days ago put a four-week pause in this province to ensure that the children of this province come first. It's the Minister of Health who confirmed that a plan is forthcoming in the context of the second wave. It is this government that put $50 million to respond to influenza and other issues that will rise within our schools. $1.3 billion to the Leader of the Opposition. We are spending twice the rate of what the New Democrats are in British Columbia by any measurement. We are fully committed to the safety of our, we are fully committed to the safety of our kids. Order. And in this province, as one of the members opposite wants to know more what we're doing, what the other provinces are not. We are the only province speaker to have invested this level of funding in cleaning, the only province speaker to have the most comprehensive masking protocol insisting of, in classrooms from grade four and up, the only province dedicating more funding to student mental health, the only province in the federation with a testing capacity for asymptomatic students in high school. Yeah. And yes, we're the only province to have financed and mandated health and safety training of Response? every single educator and every single supplier. Teacher. We will do whatever it takes to keep kids safe. The next question, the member for Nickelbell. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Prime Minister. The city is getting more dire by the day. The hospital is presently operating at 104 percent capacity. Last week, they had to cancel every single elective surgery due to overcrowding. 
The government says that they have a plan to clear the surgical backlog, but what is clear is that they either do not have a plan or the plan is not working. Will the Premier commit today to providing additional adequate funding to relieve the strain on Health Sciences North and help the people who are sick and in pain get the surgery that they desperately need? Minister of Health. Well, we certainly understand, uh, thank you very much for the question, that there are capacity issues in many hospitals across Ontario, uh, with Health Sciences North being one uh, that's experienced particular capacity problems. It is a part of our fall preparedness plan that we want to make sure that hospitals are going to be able to expand their capacity, particularly for critical care beds and for vented beds. We have made an investment in a significant increase in the number of ventilators that are going to be available. We want to make sure that they, every hospital is going to be able to meet these challenges, that they have the supplies, that have the space that they need. That will is a significant part of our, our fall plan which is going to be released very shortly. Member for Nickel Belt, supplementary. Speaker, with no help and no plan in sight from the government, the situation at Health Sciences North is only going to get worse. August and September are usually the quiet months at the hospital, but fall and flu season is coming up quickly and a second wave of COVID would make things worse, if not disastrous. The Premier and this minister cannot leave our hospital to cobble together a plan on their own. Our community, our health care system needs our hospital to be functional, and they need it to be able to withstand a surge in illness coming in a couple of months. Will the Premier and the Minister provide Sudbury Healthcare System and Health Sciences North with the funding needed to end the overcrowding, catch up on the cancelled surgery due to COVID, and withstand the increase in the fall surge? Minister of Health. Well, I, as I indicated earlier in a previous question, that the response to Wave 2 is going to be more difficult and challenging than the response to Wave 1 for the very reasons that you've outlined. We have thousands of surgeries and procedures that were postponed during Wave 1 to create that capacity in our hospital system. We don't want people to have to wait any longer for those surgeries. We know that they need them, whether they're orthopedic surgeries, cancer surgeries, cataract surgeries, uh, cardiac surgeries, whatever else that they need. So we want that to continue. We know we need to create that extra capacity in our hospital system. We also know that flu season is coming forward. We're preparing for a very, very uh, significant response to flu season to try and keep people out of hospitals. We also know that we have some people who have come back into hospital from long-term care because we need to create that capacity in the long-term care homes to create that, to have that infection prevention and control. And we response. know that there are a lot of hospitals that are waiting for that response. We are we are addressing that in our fall preparedness plan to, to allow hospitals to have that additional financial ability to create that capacity, and that will be detailed in our fall plan, which is going to be coming forward and released very soon. So that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, many people in my riding have spoken to me about the importance of access to childcare spaces. I've been holding regular meetings with various childcare operators in my riding where we discuss our common goals in providing the very best childcare for families in Peterborough Kawartha. I'd like to recognize some of the incredible leaders in childcare, especially over the last few months with the closure of the centres and then the subsequent reopenings. A special and heartfelt thank you to Anne Cathcart Andrews. Teresa Burke, Kathy Hamilton, Tanya Lundugan, Moira Vance, and Ashley Collins. I know that across the province, child care centers and home care operator operators are doing a fantastic job. Can the Minister of Education please tell this legislature what our government is doing to support these incredible people and child care across the province? Minister of Education, reply. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Peterborough Kawartha for his incredible leadership for the next generation for child care, for affordable child care in his community across our province. Speaker, I want to recognize our ECs, our staff within our 
child care centres who have gone above and beyond from the beginning of this pandemic when our government opened child care for emergency workers to support our frontline uh, women and men who served heroically then and continue to do so in this pandemic. We systematically expanded cohorts, doing it methodically, listening to evidence and listening to the doctor, chief doc uh, the chief medical officer of health, who permitted us to expand those cohorts, enabling more parents, more moms and dads to have reliable and safe access to child care in every region of this province, Speaker. We also ensured child care remained affordable by denying operators from charging parents during that period for services not rendered. We took a consumer protection lens, Response. a safety lens, and we are doing everything we can to ensure child care operators remain sustainable for decades to come, Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, I'd like to thank the minister for that fantastic answer. It's heart it is heartening to know our government is taking child care so seriously. Speaker, COVID-19 has brought challenges that no one could have imagined before the pandemic, including the temporary closure of a majority of child care centers across the province. But we as a province and the sector persevered. Centers are now operating with enhanced safety measures to protect staff, kids, and families. Can the minister please tell this legislature why reopening child care centers is so important and expand on some of the safety measures our government has put in place? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, we know how we know how integral childcare is to enabling parents and moms and dads of this province to return to the labour market. We also recognize that they want to return to work with confidence that their child can be safe. And that was the basis, Speaker, at the very beginning of this pandemic. We signaled and provided financial support, operating support, to help backstop our operators that face unprecedented challenges of closure and rising costs. That's why, Speaker, we provide them with more operating dollars. It's why we provided them with training and PPE for all of their staff, Speaker. In addition, as of September 1, to align with the uh, changes and the reopening of our schools, we have expanded cohorts within our child care very safely while maintaining a very strict health and safety safety protocol to keep the staff and likewise our kids safe. We will continue to be there for our child care sector. We just announced with the federal government, Minister Ahmed Hussein, an additional $234 million Response. in restart funding to ensure that our child care operators are sustainable and that our parents have access to affordable child care in every region of Ontario. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, the economic crisis created by COVID-19 has led to a women's labour force participation falling to its lowest since 1990. Why? Because shutdowns and layoffs have had a larger impact on sectors that traditionally employ women. These businesses, led by women, tend to be newer, smaller, and less well-financed than those owned by men. And many women have been slower to return to the workforce as they grapple with the double burden of working and caregiving. For example, employment among women with toddlers and school-aged children, it fell by 7% between February and May. The pandemic has been hardest on racialized Indigenous women, single parents, low-income women, newcomers, and women with disabilities. It is unexpe un unacceptable, Speaker, to leave whole sectors of our society behind. Is this government willing to acknowledge and address this she session? The Associate Minister for Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for that question. We recognize that women have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. Women in the hospitality and tourism industry, women in retail industry. That's why I had the opportunity to hold roundtable consultations in my own riding and heard firsthand from women entrepreneurs such as Sarah Kitchen, who owns a, a hair salon, uh, by Ashley, who owns the, our local fitness club that I belong to, and also by Nicole, who owns Studio 11 Retail. Uh, clothing outlet in Aurelia, and I commend these women for the amazing work that they have been doing during this pandemic, the creativity they have taken to putting their businesses online, to offering uh, delivery to households, but that creativity is so important. So it's, we know their uh, women have been disproportionately affected, and we will continue to work amongst all sectors to hear firsthand Spons. from women business owners what we can be doing to support them through the pandemic. The supplementary question. Speaker, women don't need a round table. They don't need more consultation. They need affordable, accessible childcare. 
The, the COVID-19 crisis has turned the clock back 30 years on women's economic rights. 30 years. The Stats can Statistics Canada Labour Force Survey has shown us the data of this she session. The Canadian and Ontario Chambers of Commerce have produced reports on next steps. Without immediate policy action, economists predict that Ontario will head into a prolonged recession. We need to be proactive now to prevent bigger issues down the road. There will be no economic recovery in the province of Ontario without a she recovery, and we should all know this. So, to the government, where is the plan to increase women's participation in the workforce in the province of Ontario? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for your supplementary question. We know that women are overrepresented in uh, precarious work and uh, low-income uh, positions, such as retail, hospitality, and tourism. But we also know that women are underrepresented in positions such as skilled trades, where only 4.5% of workers are women, in the STEM sector, where only 23% are women. These are high-paying, good jobs that lead to long-term security. That's why this government is investing $37 million to support 15,000 workers moving into the skilled trades. We know there's an opportunity here to put women into these jobs where we know right now there's thousands of jobs that are left open. These are good paying jobs and this government is working with the private sector to move women and give them the opportunity to work in the skilled trades and to get this uh, economy moving and to respond the infrastructure that is happening in this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Last week, I held a forum with experts and residents across Ontario and from my riding in Ottawa Vanier on their concerns for our long-term care system. We heard from leading experts in long-term care reform and from workers that have seen the effect of COVID-19 on the ground in these homes. One piece of feedback was clear across the board. The system needs fundamental changes to ensure long-term care homes are safe secure and supportive places for residents. From training and employing more nurse practitioners and PSWs and homes, to revising building standards, there are many ways that we can improve the system to better equip long-term care homes for the realities they face. After a lifetime of hard work, our seniors deserve to be cared for safely and with dignity. How has the ministry committing to fixing systemic issues in long-term care to better protect our province's seniors. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much for that question, and, and thank you so much for raising this issue. It is a, an issue that all of us in society have an obligation to address, and our government is fully committed uh, to our seniors, to our long-term care system reform. That's why a, a new ministry was created in the summer of 2019 to address the capacity issues that had languished for so many years, to address the staffing issues, and we started right away as soon as we became a ministry to do that. And, and we are continuing not only to deal with the COVID uh, fallout, but to continue to modernize long-term care. So we're doing this in parallel. And it is a daunting, challenging task. But looking at how we have the expert panel on staffing to inform a comprehensive staffing strategy, a modernized funding model to adjust the capacity issues, the integration with our hospitals so, so that we have a higher level of medical expertise for the complexity of our most frail uh, and most vulnerable people. This is ongoing. And I'm committed. Our government is committed. And thank you for caring. Supplementary question. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Minister of Long-Term Care. As a follow-up, I uh, understand the Ministry has a lot of responsibility that they need to meet, but as Ontario experiences an uptick in daily COVID-19 cases, we are already beginning to see a resurgence of COVID-19 outbreaks in long-term care homes. In Ottawa alone, these are currently, there are currently 11 long-term care homes that are battling outbreaks again. Having seen the devastating effects of the first wave in our province's homes, it is critical that we use every available moment to improve long-term care to protect the safety of our province's seniors in the wake of a likely second wave. What is the ministry doing to prepare long-term care homes to safely weather a second wave of COVID-19? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again. And I, I want to make sure that everyone understands that in long-term care, an outbreak means one person who is tested positive, and that could be a staff member 
who is self-isolating at home. There could be absolutely no cases in the home itself. And, and that is the case right now in the outbreaks that we have in Ontario. The majority have no um, cases in the home or one resident case. There are a couple homes that are struggling, and that is exactly where our attention is focused, to improve the IPAC, to make sure the staffing is stable, to, to provide the support for the home, whether it's through the $240 million that's gone out the door, to address the surge capacity, staffing, making sure that there's ex additional measures for infection control, and again, integrating with our expertise across the medical system, uh, working with our Response. Ontario public health units, making sure our medical officers of health are, are in contact with us, that we know exactly what's happening in those homes, and giving them the support that they need. This is ongoing, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development Mines, and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. We know that Ontario is a leading global jurisdiction in mineral exploration and production. Over my years as an MPP, I've had the pleasure of visiting a number of mines and seeing the impact they have on local economies. Ontario's mining sector supports 71,000 jobs in mine production and processing, mineral exploration and mining supplies and services. Can the minister share with this House the significance of last week's groundbreaking announcement at the new Cote Gold Mine in Gogama to the local and provincial economy? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd be pleased to, and I want to thank the member for Perry Sound Muskoka for his incredible work, not just in his constituency, but for our plans for Northern Ontario moving forward in uh, uh, economic COVID recovery. Mr. Speaker, let's just throw out a couple of numbers. On a beautiful day in Gogama, blue sky, 7 million ounces of high grade gold sitting in the ground beneath us uh, together. Uh, with uh, the folks from Gogama, Flying Coast First Nation, Metogamy First Nation, and others, uh, realized an incredible opportunity, Mr. Speaker. Over the course of this lifetime, we're looking at $5 billion in wages for local workers, $10 billion, Mr. Speaker, to the province of Ontario's gross domestic product, and that's in the first 18 years. There's an incredible opportunity for this to go more than 30 years. A thousand construction jobs. Mr. Speaker, a thousand people got the call this week and next. Response. They got the job to help build that mine, and 450 people will work long term at that site. We're so proud of Cote Gold and the local communities for their work on this project. And the supplementary question. And thank you to the Minister for that answer and for leading the development of this project that will bring prosperity and employ so many in Northern Ontario. Can the minister please share the specific ways we've been able to accelerate this and several other mining projects in Ontario in the past two years? Minister of Energy, Northern Development, and Mines. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's true that uh, about 18 months ago, this project was had a high prospect of being shelved, bogged down in red tape and, and legislation from the previous government. This mining site, like other mining sites across Northern Ontario weren't going anywhere, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, uh, what this project had in common with the Sugar Zone, the Premier and I visited it, how sweet it was, Mr. Speaker, to see that mine go live, uh, and as well to see the um, uh, Newmont Gold Corp's Borden mine completely electrified. What they had in common, Mr. Speaker, was a frustration of a decade and a half of red tape, Mr. Speaker, bogged down and not letting these projects go forward. I think it's pretty safe to say in the past couple of years, Mr. Speaker, that this government has done more to move mining operations Spons. to critical milestones, get people to work in communities across Northern Ontario, despite the fact that the NDP and Liberals consistently, Mr. Speaker, voted for legislation to stall or... Thank you. Next question, the member for Brampton Moore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Parents in my community are so worried about the Conservatives' bargain basement education plan that over 10,000 students have pulled from the classroom by their parents. So many families changed their minds that the school board had to delay the start of school. But who could blame them, Mr. Speaker? Case counts are going up, but we still don't have access to enough testing, and the government isn't doing a thing to keep the families safe. But the Conservatives' failure to plan now means thousands of families are scrambling to rearrange work schedules and childcare arrangements so they can send their children to school online. 
What does the Premier have to say to the thousands of families in my riding of Brampton, Brampton North, in Peel Region, who have been hurt by this government's decision to save money on the backs of our kids and teachers? Minister of Education. Well, Mr. Speaker, under our government's leadership and under the Premier's leadership, we have unlocked for Peel District School Board alone $64 million in additional funding to hire more educators, to space out these classrooms, to ensure air ventilation, HVAC capacity is improved, and to hire more custodians and cleaning staff. That just is a matter of fact, provided by, yes, reserve funding, federal funding, and of course the province stepping up significantly to respond to this unprecedented challenge. In Peel District School Board, where I met with the associate medical officer, where I met with the head of public health nurses in that health region. We're hiring more than doubling capacity of public health nurses, 64 no, more nurses hired in that region, delivering critical supports for families in Brampton, in Caledon, in Mississauga, and all regions of Peel. We are absolutely committed to their, those families. We are committed to expanding testing, to putting a four-week pause on Response. any future expansions. We have set aside $50 million to deal with influenza. We've demonstrated it, and word indeed, we will be there for our kids. Speaker. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Brampton has been called an epicenter for the virus. And as case counts in our community continue to rise and the likelihood of a second wave gets closer, it's not just the parents in Peel who are going to be pulling their kids out of school. Just yesterday, the Toronto District School Board announced they had to delay the start of online classes after their numbers of kids opting out of the classroom also jumped. Premier, parents, students, teachers, and schools in Brampton and across this province are all paying the price because the Conservatives failed to do the right thing. Hire more teachers, cap classroom sizes at 15 kids, and invest in safe schools every day families are begging for. Question. Mr. Speaker, why doesn't the government think that these schools' families are worth investing in? Why won't this Premier do everything he can to keep Ontarians safe? Again, the Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the safe reopening plan that's been brought forth for the schools and for the people of Ontario has been fully supported and endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health of this province. The senior most authority that has ably guided our province through the worst of this pandemic. What he has said, likewise what many other institutions, including sick kids, have made clear. You need to have a multitude of actions and preventative actions to mitigate the spread within our class. That's the basis for hiring 2,000 more educators, $200 million to achieve that in every board. We're seeing that in Peel and likewise in Toronto. The member opposite asked about Toronto District School Board. Say that as an example. In those communities at risk, there is an absolute cap and pose of 15 between kindergarten and grade three. Let me just re-emphasize that. Between grade four and grade eight, an absolute cap of 20 and 15 in high school. We are Response. absolutely delivering funding to ensure we maximize saving, maximize safety, and we're doing everything possible to keep kids safe. Speaker. Order. The next question. Member for Don Valley East. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, preliminary results from the COVID-19 classroom stimulation study run by the SickKids Sick Hospital could not be clearer. They found that, quote, it was not possible to maintain a two-meter distance between students and accommodate more than 12 to 15 students in the classes, even when desks were put against the four walls. Now, Back on June 19th, Speaker, the minister actually agreed that uh, during a COVID-19 press conference, he told Ontarians that classroom sizes, and I quote, would be no more than 15 students. Speaker, through you to the minister, what's changed? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Let me just uh, repeat what Dr. Williams, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, responded when that question was raised. Quote, we were the only we were only doing about less than 10,000 tests a day. Only our, our, our percent of positivity uh, was then well over 4 to 5 percent, so we were looking at that. We saw in the migration of everybody coming back from March break, we became aware of that. In fact, even though we were told originally that there was no evidence of infection on the eastern seaboard, there actually was undetected. And so there was a great concern about the amount of spread. Our numbers rapidly moved. As you noted, the numbers you said we were going up by over 100 percent almost every other day to three to four days, from 20 to 60, 150. And then the week after, you noted, we were around the corner of 350, and we were right up to 600 fairly soon after. Clearly, Speaker, the 
There have been changes in the risk profile. We've ensured boards have $1.3 billion of funding. We're giving Response. them resources to hire educators, hire custodians, and ensure all kids remain safe in this province. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I met with a bunch of parents from Don Mills Middle School, and they were worried because their grade 7 8 classes were at 36. Thankfully, an extra teacher, which the minister keeps talking about all this money, they got an extra teacher, and the classroom sizes, and the classroom sizes have, have fallen to just below 30. So, Speaker, the government's plan is flawed. The minister has said that we have the best science backing our plan. Well, the Hospital for Sick, sick Children is at the forefront of children health sciences. Speaker, through you to the minister, in light of the pre preliminary results of this study, will the government re-examine their plan, take expert advice, and reduce class sizes? 29 students, even with your allocated funding, is way too high. Minister of Education. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I think we have demonstrated by setting aside 50 million additional dollars to respond to uh, influenza and the second wave, we are clearly underscoring our commitment to continue to scale up, invest more, and do everything humanly possible, including a $380 million. Uh, $360 million allocation as of January of 2021, further funding to do what the member opposite called for, something that we agree with. The reason why boards in this province are hiring over 2,000 educators is because we provided a significant infusion, a one-time investment of $1.3 billion, supported by the feds and, of course, board resources. We have put investments in place for hiring of new educators, for more distancing, for more custodial staff, for expanding testing in every area we lead in the nation, and we'll continue to demonstrate to parents as this risk and as this challenge uh, continues in our province. We'll invest more and do whatever it takes Bonds. to keep our kids safe. Speaker. The next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to Solicitor General. Last month, the Solicitor General made an exciting announcement when it comes to the province's correctional system in eastern Ontario. The announcement included a new jail to be built in Kempville, next to my riding, as well as rebuilding the Brockville Jail and improving the St. Lawrence Valley Treatment Centre in eastern Ontario. These are significant projects, Speaker, and I know that they will make an impact on the ongoing issues facing the correctional system. But it's important that, that, part of the, that the part of the design and construction of such large infrastructure projects input and consult, consultation from all community partners and stakeholders, stakeholders be given consideration. To that end, can the Solicitor General explain what consultations will go on into these projects and how their feedback can be incorporated into these projects? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, South, South Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry for the question. You know, it was a real pleasure for me to be able to join my colleagues, Minister Fullerton, Minister Clark, the member from Carleton, and the member from Ottawa West Nepean. You got to keep listening. I was pleased to join many local leaders in Eastern Ontario to announce our correction strategy. And the member is absolutely right. Input from our partners is so incredibly important for the success success of these projects, and he knows that very well as a former mayor himself. That includes municipal leadership, our frontline correctional officers and justice sector partners, and the wider community across eastern Ontario. As our partners at OPSU Corrections Division indicated, this investment will go a long way to ensuring professional service delivery across eastern Ontario. Response. And these projects will move through the design process. We will be hosting engagement sessions that are critically important to make sure that we get this infrastructure right. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, thank you to the Solicitor General for the response. I'm sure that members of my community are looking forward to engaging in the cons consultation process as these projects move from concept to reality. However, the physical buildings, are, while important, are only one aspect that goes into addressing the issues faced in the correctional system. I understand the Solicitor General announced an increase in staffing within the correctional facilities that would support the frontline correctional officers and keep those within provincial corrections safe. So can the Solicitor General provide an update on this announcement and explain how it ties into with the infrastructure projects in Eastern Ontario? Again, the Solicitor General. Thank 
Thank you so much. Absolutely right. You know, the uh, facilities are critical, but frankly, so are the staff resources, which is why I was so pleased when Premier Ford and I had the opportunity to announce $500 million, the hiring of 500 additional corrections staff. These are the people who are going to provide the services that keep our community safe, and uh, it's a major infrastructure investment. Um, in infrastructure as well as res staff resources. It will also help to modernize outdated facilities to, to support programming within our, our institutions. Our investment in people and infrastructure, combined with our critical investments across the Eastern Region, will help create a better, safer environment for staff and all those in Ontario's correction systems. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Beaches East York. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. School starts today for many students in Beaches East York. Parents and teachers have been reaching out to me over social media, email, the phone, every way they possibly can. They're anxious, stressed, panicking. One mom wrote, I'm a mother, terrified for her kids. I haven't slept properly in months. A teacher shared that in her school, every grade has kids over the cap. The kindergarten classes are set to have 30 students in them. In yet another school, the grade 7 class has 27 kids. In yet another, it is 34, bigger than before the pandemic. Teachers have shown me pictures of the desks in their classes. There's barely room for an adult to walk between them. Parents know that sick kids and other health experts insist that physical distancing is impossible with more than 12 or 15 students. The Premier doesn't appear to be listening to health experts or parents. Who is he listening to? And why isn't the government ensuring that all classes, without exception, are capped at 15? Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, we have full confidence in the Chief Medical Officer of Health of this province who has given his endorsement for our plan. And, Speaker, the reason why he has done so is because we have followed the advice of, of the medical community, including at SickKids, who has called for layers of prevention, multiple actions to prevent the spread. That is precisely what we've done in our plan. We've introduced an expansion of hiring of custodians, over 1,300, to make sure that our schools are constantly cleaned on a more active and regular basis. We've improved air ventilation in our oldest schools, $1.4 billion dollars annually allocated an additional 50 million dollars for air hvac systems we've ensured cohorting and the staggering of class we've ensured buses and schools start to different times mitigating the spread of those cohorts we have the smallest direct and indirect number of students that could um, interact amongst the major provinces bc is at 120 and ontario is actually at 100. speaker we put 1.3 billion dollars of investment in all schools response we're seeing, in all school boards we're seeing classrooms come down i know there's more work to do that our boards are undertaking in real time once those numbers are known. We have faith in our boards. We have faith in our student speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. One mom wrote to me that she recently learned that her son's grade 8 class will have 29 students and could have more by the time classes resume. This is totally unacceptable. That's her quote. She would love the Premier to spend a week in her child's poorly ventilated classroom where kids will be unable to socially distance by even one metre. Parents know that the government's funding formula forces schools to collapse classes as kids leave for remote learning, which means that packed classrooms sit right next to empty ones. One mom is apoplectic that her kid's grade 7 class is 25 per cent bigger than it was before the pandemic. As one mother said, I cannot tell you how stressful and traumatizing this is for families. Speaker, why hasn't the Premier fixed the funding formula that keeps classes dangerously high when health professionals are saying they need to be capped at 15? Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have allocated over $1.3 billion in net new one-time investment to respond to COVID-19 to maintain our schools. In Toronto District School Board, in communities where the member represents, in communities that have higher risk of transmission, working with the local public health officer, uh, including uh, uh, including uh, uh, local public health, the chief medical officer, and, as well as the COVID-19 command table, identifying, Speaker, those higher-risk communities. There are absolute caps imposed, including 15 from kindergarten to grade three, 20 from grade four to eight, and as the member opposite knows, in high school, it is capped at, tw at 15 students in all designated boards, in Peel, in York, in, in Durham, and likewise in Toronto. We have done everything we can to mitigate the 
uh, spread in their schools. But we recognize, as the Minister of Health has said, we have to reduce community transmission risk in order to in, uh, protect our schools. We recognize the relationship between the two, which is why we're calling on all parents, all families, all citizens to continue Response. to do their part to help us flatten the curve in this province. Speaker. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, uh, Training and Skills Development. During the pandemic, many people in Ontario have experienced job loss or significant reduction in their work, and I certainly hear from my constituents in Eglinton Lawrence that COVID-19 has impacted them greatly. And although jobs are coming back and every new and returning job represents good news for a worker and their family, there is still a high level of unemployment. Can the minister explain what our government is doing to help Ontario economically recover from COVID-19? Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the member from Eglinton Lawrence for that very, very important question this morning. Through you, Mr. Speaker, as we have seen throughout the pandemic, our government remains committed to supporting the people, the workers, and the businesses right across the province. Mr. Speaker, just one example of this commitment is when I joined the Premier and the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade at ABC Technologies in Etobicoke to announce $9.3 million for 11 GTA-based training projects. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that this strategic investment will help thousands of people prepare for auto and advanced manufacturing careers. The training projects range from hands-on learning opportunities for students in co-op or internship settings to short-duration, high-quality college courses that help laid-off workers learn to operate high-tech machines Response. or gain credentials for good jobs in the automotive or advanced manufacturing sector. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, it's great to hear that Ontario is helping young people um, to, to, and workers to receive the skills and training that they need to join our modern workforce and contribute to the recovery of the province. Mr. Speaker, we need to make Ontario open for business again, and there will continue to be a great demand for workers in these skilled trades, which are challenging, exciting, and often very well-paid careers. Could the minister please explain to the House what specific skills this funding will help to train people in? Minister of Labour. Hi. Well, thank you, and I uh, thank the member uh, again for this question this morning. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that 2,300 students, apprentices, and laid off workers will benefit from this $9.3 million strategic investment. As the member stated, automotive and advanced manufacturing are critical and crucial to getting Ontario's economy back on track. There are jobs available in these sectors today. We are helping people upgrade their skills so they can access them. We are creating a talent pipeline that satisfies employers' needs. Mr. Speaker, our government has worked closely with labour and employers to help bridge the skills gap. We want everyone in Ontario to get a good job and thrive. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This pandemic has blown the lid off the crisis in long-term care system. There's also a crisis in home care system, too, and people aren't getting the help they need. I want to tell you about Joe, who's 84, a longtime St. David's Lions volunteer. His wife, Margaret, is 78, has advanced dementia, and needs home care. Joe has been his sole caregiver for three years and wants to continue to care for her at home as he loves her dearly, but he can't because he needs to recover from his own major surgery. Because of the lack of funding and home care from the government, Margaret is going to have to leave her home. The last thing that Margaret wants to do and Joe wants to do is leave her home. Question. He wants to take care of her. Speaker, why can't seniors in this province access the care they need to stay in their own homes? Minister of Health. Well, as a matter of fact, we're certainly aware of that issue. That is one of the reasons why we are bringing forward the transformation of our health care system to allow people to be more connected 
with health care every step along their health care journey. We know that there are issues related to people being discharged from hospital, for example, that need home care when they get home. Often by the time they get home, they don't know who is providing the home care, for what duration, and they have multiple caregivers coming and going. That cannot continue. That is not patient-centered care. That's not good quality care. That is why we're doing the transformation to bring forward the local Ontario health teams to help connect that care for people so that if they leave the hospital and they have the home care, they will know before they leave the hospital Response. who will be providing the care, what care will be provided, and for what duration. That is good quality care, and that is what we are moving towards in Ontario. In the supplementary. Back to the Premier. Let's be clear. It's because of this Conservative government's underfunding of home care that this family has to make a tough decision to move Margaret out of her home and into long-term care, where we've had close to 2,000 deaths with COVID-19. Unfortunately, there's a wait list of up to three years for a bed in certain homes in our community. Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. Seniors in our community should get the care they need when and where they need it, whether that's at home or in a long-term care facility or in a retirement home. This, this situation is the definition of a crisis. Why does the Premier do nothing while Margaret can't get sufficient home care and may have to wait three years to get a bed in long-term care? Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, I can certainly agree with you, speaking through you, Mr. Speaker, to the member that people, seniors deserve to get the care that they need when they need it and where they need it. That's why we're making this transformation. That's why we're connecting people to the health care system, whether they're in hospital, whether they're in home care, or whether they're in long-term care. That is the whole point of the transformation that we're bringing forward. We want people to get that care. Uh, the one issue that I cannot agree with you with, again, through you, Mr. Speaker, is the investments. We have made significant investments in home and community care, significant investments in long-term care, and significant investments in hospital care. These are bearing the foundation for the future. That is why we're doing the transformation, and we are making those investments so that all seniors across the province, regardless of where they live in the province, will have access Bonds. to that care that they need. That is the goal of this government, and that's what we're providing for. The next question, the member for Glanbrook, Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. During the COVID-19 pandemic, inquiries from my constituents about their poor and unreliable broadband service have been pouring into my office. Evidently, too many people in our province lack reliable internet, cellular access, or don't have any connectivity at all. I was excited to see our government step up and make a commitment of $315 million to projects that will improve connectivity for people and businesses alike. And I'm excited about the new opportunities the $150 million funding program called ICON could bring. Yet, Minister, we often hear you say that you know this funding isn't enough and that there is more work to do, especially more support from the federal government. Would you please tell us exactly what it will take to close the digital divide. Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you uh, to the member from Lambert-Lambrook for her advocacy for her constituents, especially on this issue. And let me be begin by explaining that broadband is a federally regulated sector. Its agency, the CRTC, is responsible for establishing countrywide standards and rates for internet and cellular connectivity. As the Premier said yesterday, it's estimated that it will cost between $10 and $15 billion to get Ontario up to speed. That's why we are calling on the federal government to do its part and properly fund broadband. The Federal Minister of Rural Economic Development has promised the sector a nearly $1.7 billion funding program under the Universal Broadband Fund, and yet not a cent has flowed to our wow. province. Wow. So frankly, Ontario can't wait. The digital divide Response. is widening. We know our government has an important part to play, but we need other partners, especially the federal government, to lend their investments Absolutely. and their expertise. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. And the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the minister. I received an email from Kim in Waterdown with concerns about reliable broadband, and it reads, I'm sure you have received many emails in regards to this issue. I live in Waterdown, and I have horrible internet. For example, I was trying to download your website. It took eight minutes. 
My download speed is 0.54 megabits per second and 0.01 megabits per second upload speed, and we pay $179 a month for this. I have not been able to work from home, and because of that, I may not be able to go back to work till possibly December. It's very frustrating not being able to have this service when a lot of people rely on it. Minister, when might people like him in Waterdown be able to have reliable high speed Question. internet connectivity? <laughs> Minister to reply. Well, thank you to the member for sharing Kim's comments with me. Uh, I want to say to Kim, I understand where you're coming from. I live in a rural area and I have the same difficulties. To echo the Premier's recent comments, no infrastructure project is more important to the people of Ontario than broadband. That is why we have a plan. In June, I unveiled our newest $150 million funding program called Improving Connectivity here, here. for Ontario, or ICON, and we launched the application, which closed on August 21st this year. This is just one of the steps we're taking to deliver broadband to more people across Ontario. And while I'm proud that our government has stepped up and delivered $315 million in funding, it's Response. simply not enough to bring everyone in Ontario up to speed. We can't do it alone. That's why we're calling on the federal government to give Ontario its fair share in broadband funding. And I hope that in a year or so, Kim will have better funding. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. For months, essential workers across Ontario waited for this government to slowly deliver the pandemic pay it promised. In Hamilton, we still hear from essential workers who haven't received a penny. Workers at Victoria Manor, Capcart, Cathmar Manor, Roslyn Retirement Homes bravely cared for seniors, even while facing some of the worst COVID-19 outbreaks in the province, and while working under notoriously bad owners and management. These frontline workers are heroes who worked tirelessly to ensure that seniors get the care they need, yet still this government allows them to keep their licenses to operate. I say bad business. Why have these frontline workers in our community received why haven't they received their pandemic pay and why has the premier let these workers down? The president of the Treasury Board to reply. Well, thank you Mr. Speaker. Thank you and it's great to see uh, all our colleagues back in the house and everyone safe. So uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you uh, for the member opposite through you for that question. And uh, I agree with her completely. The support of our frontline workers through the pandemic pay was an absolutely essential tool throughout this, uh, this pandemic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we partnered with the federal government to deliver over $1.5 billion, over 375,000 people, over 2,000 employers, the largest program in all of Canada. And Mr. Speaker, virtually everyone has been paid, Mr. Speaker. Right. So we'll continue to support those frontline workers who have worked hard throughout this pandemic to make sure all Ontarians are safe. That concludes our question period for this morning. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.